Hi, this is Kathy Buchanan, writer for Adventures in Odyssey, and you are watching the Advent and Blah. Hi, this is Kathy Buchanan, writer for Adventures in Odyssey, and you are watching the Adventures in Odyssey podcast. Hey everybody, it's Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Meltzner. Hey. It's episode 129 of the podcast. Victoria, what are we doing today? We're interviewing someone. And who is that person? You tell me. I, I don't know. <laughs> someone. We're talking to Kathy Buchanan today. <gasps> who's that? Which who's, is super exciting. Who's that, Dad? It was, well, you're going to find out in a minute because we'll read the whole bio as soon as the interview starts. Oh, okay. It was super duper exciting and funny and like so good please watch this whole video Everything. kathy she's great was she is a lovely person lovely and a lovely delight queen. and it was so much fun honestly the this queen was, of odyssey this was maybe the longest episode it's taken to edit just because the tech stuff was like so difficult to fit it all together it probably doesn't look like it's been edited for like a dozen hours but it was that's trust me the fact that you can't tell it's edited for a dozen hours is the reason Devin's that it took been a dozen ignoring hours. Me for like the past two is weeks the reason so we that can it finish editing took so this. long to edit. Um, but my point is, even though I watched the interview that many times, even in the last pass through, I was just smiling constantly, unconsciously. Like I just would be watching it, going through stuff, he and just staring realizing staring at his own just, face like Narcissus, just mesmerized. <laughs> I was smiling so hard because we just had so much fun and it was so entertaining and interesting and stuff it was such a good interview so you know what we should probably do victoria uh talk for another 10 minutes yes that's exactly it uh we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna turn you over to the interview and stop hyping it up and just let you watch it um and so presented without comment except with a whole bunch of comments uh, but without, and another thank you to kathy yes thank you so much presented without any more comments us. Here's our interview with Kathy wearing a Buchanan. Enjoy. So we're here now with Kathy Buchanan. Um, for those who don't know, Kathy Buchanan is a writer and director for Adventures in Odyssey, having written 85 episodes and directed 33 over the last 17 years. She's a mother of five, has a master's in biblical counseling, and has written at least 10 books, seven of which were for Adventures in Odyssey. And she's most well known as a writer of slice of life, comedy, and romance episodes, and particularly known for her infamous creation of Robert Mitchell and his contentious relationship with Connie Kendall. Thank you so much for letting us interview you, Kathy. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it turns out not only is this an interview for us as fans of you, but you for as a, a fan of us, which is yes, very unexpected. Yes, I've, I've watched the odd cast. You guys are great, so Thank it you. is fun. It's an honor to be here with you. So uh, I think the obligatory starting question for an interview is, how mm -hmm. did you first begin with writing slash get involved with Adventures in Odyssey specifically? Um, I started because... Um, by accident, pretty much. I um, I had I started at Focus. I grew up in Michigan, and I moved out to Colorado. And I was doing an internship in at Focus's um, advertising um, department. So I was doing back cover copy, and um, you know, in the inserts in their magazines, writing up like descriptions of the books and stuff, and. I thought, hey, this is a great job. Maybe I can make this a full-time gig. And so I um, tried, talked to my boss at the time and said, hey, do you think I could do this full-time? And he said, we really don't have the budget for it. And so I thought, well, if I want to stay in Colorado, I better find another job. And somebody mentioned that Adventures in Odyssey, which was another department at Focus, was looking for a coordinator. And... I hadn't heard Adventures in Odyssey ever, <laughs> and um, I mean, heard of it, but I'd never listened to it, and so I thought, well, that sounds, I need a job, so I interviewed for it, and um, and at the time, I would, um, and so I interviewed for it, and the next day, they called me and offered me the job, and so I went to go tell my boss that 
I was taking this job and he wasn't there that day. And so um, I just started the next following day, Monday. And I learned very quickly that I'm not a good coordinator because it requires like organizational skills and filing things and remembering things and um, and just not my forte. And so, um, and funny was that, not at the time it wasn't funny, but um, my boss from my advertising department called and said, ah, on Thursday I went to HR and I got your job approved. And so I was gonna hire you and um, and then I was sick on Friday, and by then I had just already taken this job. And so I always think like how close I came to not even writing for Odyssey, because I totally would have stayed in adver the advertising department and done marketing copy. And that's so depressing to me now to even, <laughs> to even think that that's what I, you know. And but I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that God like orchestrated it like that. And so I ended up at Odyssey and in a job that I hated. And, um, and just, just because I wasn't very good at it. And so I would get frustrated with it. And I think I probably frustrated some other people in the process. And, um, and so probably about three months into it, I, um, I went and talked to, um, one of my professors at the, it was at Focus on Family Institute, which, um, was there at the time. And, um, have you heard of John Eldridge? I think so. Yes. It rings a bell. Okay. Anyway, he was one of my professors, and I went to talk to him, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I should be doing, and da 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 and I don't like my job. And he said, oh, Kathy, this job is killing your soul. You have to stop and go and get your master's in counseling. And so I went, because that day I had my, um, my um, like, three months, like, how are you doing kind of evaluation. And so I went in and Al Jansen was um, the producer at the time. And, um, and so I was basically gonna quit. And he said, um, Kathy, well, this really isn't your gift as a coordinator. And I thought, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> you know? And um, before I can even quit. And he said, but you've had some good contributions at the writers meeting and you know, maybe do you want to just you want to try writing some scripts? And I thought, yeah, I do. Like <laughs> that sounds awesome. And so, anyway, so I went ahead and I still went and got my master's in counseling. I did like evening and weekend classes, classes, and then, um, but then I started also writing for Odyssey, and I've never looked back. It has been the best job in the world, absolutely, and I'm so grateful for it. That's probably a longer, you know, response. No, that was, that was great. That was a good <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned like how perfectly God lined up things for you to get into that job, you know, which I think happens with a lot yes. of things in life. You know, you look back on it. It's like, wow, that shouldn't have happened the way it did. But, you know, just... I know, I know. And you're like, and at the time you think, I mean, I seriously was thinking, God, why did you have Brad be sick that day? Like, I wouldn't be stuck doing this, mm -hmm. but I don't like. And yet there was a whole bigger plan that I had never yeah. even imagine I never even thought I could be a professional writer like people don't do that you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just it's just kind of crazy so on on that note then how has Adventures in Odyssey affected your spiritual life as you've been writing things what are the lessons that he's taught you through the writings that you've done it's so funny I mean when you even say that like 17 years like really like I've been writing that long for this I mean I've grown up on the show really I mean I wasn't even um engaged you know when I started and then you know got married at the time that Connie didn't yeah and well um, yeah because you were originally Kathy Waringa on the show and then your credit and that was the famous story right with uh something old something new or sorry with something blue yes. is that your uh, your credit changed written by Kathy Waringa yeah. and directed by Kathy Buchanan because yeah. I yeah because I got married in between and um so yeah, and then started having kids, and um, we adopted two boys from Burundi, Africa, a couple of years ago. And so, um, the whole story of Buck is very, even though that was a Paul McCusker brainchild, like that story has become very near and dear to me as I've watched my own boys adjust to a new life and you know a new family. And um, and so, of course, just and the girls, my girls right now are, who are my older three, are. 
um, 8, 10, and 13. So they're right at that, like, age. And so they give me a ton of ideas, you know, based just not intentionally. Uh-huh. You know, but it's like <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> an embarrassing moment that I'm like, hmm, you know, I know I should be feeling bad for you, but that's a great story. You know, so, um, but as far as just um, spiritually, like, um, you know, it's a good place for me to, it, and I think it's true for all the writers, we end up writing stories that reflect where we are spiritually. So like books that we've read, you know, or about like gratitude or hope or doubt or whatever, like end up coming into themes in these stories just because that's where I am myself. And so I, I kind of noticed that going back, like, oh, I remember why I wrote, wrote that story or, and that helped me process through kind of those questions or what I was struggling with because I started looking, you know, into it. Um, I would say Irena, just doing the research for Irena Sendler, um, was one of those that was like, wow, that's really impacted me, like hearing her story and, mm-hmm. and re-examining like, what is life really about here and what should I be doing, you know, and um, things like that. So it has, um, to both and it's funny because it's also easier for me to like discipline my kids with it because like if they're like fighting in the car and then I can say instead of lecturing them because who wants to listen to your mom lecture to you mm-hmm. I send them to my to their room so they can listen to an odyssey <laughs> you know I'm like listen and to and more this indirectly have yes them. exactly yeah, exactly <laughs> and sometimes it is, it is it's funny like because like my oldest came when, when this is a, a while ago she came out she's like I just heard anger mismanagement and da 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 and I think that's you know I'm like oh look I lectured you without even knowing it you know <laughs> or without you even knowing it you learned the lesson so anyway no escape <laughs> there's no escape exactly yeah I was listening yesterday to your uh, your interview on the official podcast about writing one more name slash in jars mm-hmm. of play and it was it was great getting to hear like how different it was for you researching that episode like the different writing process that went into it mm-hmm. we'd love as you i assume you know we really really love those episodes oh, i haven't heard that one i haven't heard that, so okay that yeah it was now that i know you so like good, it so. i can listen to it <laughs> <laughs> um so. it's it's funny i was telling victoria yesterday how i'm i'm pretty i mean i know there's the effect of like oh once you know about it you see it everywhere but i'm pretty sure i'd never heard of irena sendler before that episode and mm-hmm. in the months since it came out i've seen at least three posts online mm-hmm. of like videos explaining the three completely different posts being like hey look at this this is who she is this is what she did and every time i'm like hey yeah. look at that is <laughs> know all about her that's awesome yeah it is it is funny and that's when i had first heard about it too i mean i had actually pitched that show a couple different times um, and it was, there was always a reason why it couldn't happen, but I'm grateful for the timing that it did. Yeah. You know, I like feel like just, God really lined up the it timing. Was, yeah. It, and, it, and for me, even like, I don't know if I was ready to write it back when I first mm-hmm. had the idea of it, you know, because I feel like I, you know, I'm continually growing as a writer too. And so it's, it was, it was good. I'm glad I got to do it. So, speaking of writing episodes, you're providing so many great transitions. <laughs> How does uh, it differ directing episodes you've written versus directing episodes you haven't written? And which one is harder? That's from one of our watchers named Tintin. I feel like that mm-hmm. one could go either way, because if you wrote the episode, then you're like, oh, well, I spent so much time on this particular scene, I don't, you know, don't want to let my baby go. Uh-huh. But if you didn't write the episode, then you, you know it's kind of worse in a way because it's like oh I don't want to let go of this this I don't know what their intention was I don't know what I might be letting go of that's important for them I don't want to you know judge their writing when I don't know that process it is I mean because when I'm writing a show I'm I'm hearing it and so I know what how I want the line delivered and especially the comedic lines like um Mm. I, I, I can hear it in my head and so I know I know how I want it to move and where I want it to slow down and speed up mm-hmm. and um and so when I'm directing somebody else's show like I just directed one of Marshall's and it's like to feel like you have to kind of get into their inside their brain and think mm-hmm. how were they hearing this and um and so was this more dry humor or broad humor and um and so I try to talk you know I talk to the writer ahead of time just to like go through okay what were you thinking with this section and this section but it's still a challenge because you also don't want to disappoint the writer, you know, because, yeah. you know, like you said, it's their baby. And so you don't want to go in and be like, 
but to their baby, you know. <laughs> so yeah. um, I was I wasn't gonna say that. But yeah. <laughs> Do you but, have moments where someone's directing for one of your episodes and you just hear a part and you're like, oh my gosh, you got that so perfectly? Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's times, and really, even with the the actors, I mean, I might have it in my head a way, a certain way, and then I'm in in the studio and they do it and I'm like oh, I like that way better you know they they just took it to a whole different level and so um that's a whole aspect too but I mean answer the question I feel like it's harder to direct somebody else's show just because there's that pressure of you don't want to disappoint them and yeah um and trying to read their mind in certain parts so yeah I imagine it must get you know easier when you've worked for so long with writers that you you know, you know them well enough mm-hmm. to know what they were going for in lots of places, as opposed to like when a freelance writer comes in yeah. and you know don't know where they're coming from as much. Yeah, that does. Yeah, it does help. And we are a close so, team. Like we're very. I mean, I love the people I work with. I mean, they're just phenomenal, and so um, we have a we have a lot of fun. So they're great to work with. Another excellent transition. So the the writing team for the show is like. It's a it's a pretty core team that stayed fairly constant over time mm-hmm. with, you know, a couple changes. Obviously there's a lot of new people who came in around the Al Jansen era, including mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. which we'll talk about later. So overall for the show, you're the fourth most prolific writer, having written eighty five episodes. Um, mm-hmm. including one lots of those were like multiple writers, especially Novacom where we had different yeah. storylines yeah. coming in, different mm-hmm. people writing it. Um, but if you I went on AI Wiki and I was looking at the writer's list and sorted by most to least episodes written and looking down the names it's like you know you come in fourth and then you keep on scrolling down and Susan McBride is the next woman on the list and she's only written 10 episodes way back in the day and so it's way mm-hmm. down the list so being the only regular primary woman on the writing team what is that like and have you ever had any challenges with that in terms of how you approach a topic on the show or either as an individual writing or in group writing experiences when you're working as a team, like, is there any other challenges when you handle a topic of being the only woman? Yes, always, always and forever. <laughs> like, it's, um, yes, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think that the story that kind of embodies that is when I, I started coming up with a boyfriend for Connie, which was the whole, the whole Mitch debacle and um era I should say era the Mitch era and um and so as I'm talking about you know this idea of introducing this guy that she has a crush on and and somehow in the course of that hour-long meeting we ended up with like explosions and death and, like, and, and secret agents and and it was like wait how did this happen because then he became all rolled in full Novacom thing which um, wasn't my original intent which I love I I love that it ended up that way but I just kind of I remember coming out of that meeting feeling like wow that was that was not where I saw that going <laughs> so um, but um, since then I think I've learned myself just about. Yeah, you can add some romance, but make sure there's some um, drama and adventure and, you know, mystery in there, too. So, um, but I I have been known to be like, well, first of all, I just wanted Connie to have some friends because I thought, what is she doing hanging out with all these old men? I mean, it's mm-hmm. like, it was so <laughs> Thank you. Heavy. That's a fair so question. Thank you. And then there's Connie, you know, and it's like, but there's like... Jason and Eugene and Whit and um, Jack and Tom, Tom and, and Bernard. Yeah. yeah Bernard and so it's like all these like old and you know hanging out and then Connie I'm like she needs a friend like what kind of sixteen year old girl doesn't have a a friend who's a girl you know and so mm-hmm. um, and so I've been happy that we've had Penny come through and now we have Jules and um, so it's um, I've really, so, but it's kind of funny because you write what you know, and, um, and so, I mean, start, like, all these guys would get in the room, and, you know, of course, they're writing shows that would interest them, and sound like they do, and talk like they do, and so, um, so I would, I would come and shake things up a bit, and call them on things, like, there's no women in that script, you know, and. Thank you. So, that, <laughs> so anyway. The lone, the lone lawman, I didn't even realize it the first time listening to the episode which was a OAC episode in the first 
the first season. It was like the mm-hmm. audio drama um, in the Western. the Western, yeah, like the Lone Ranger parody. And I didn't even realize it the first time listening through, but there's not a single woman in the entire episode, mm-hmm. not even in the background, like. And then one of the characters points that out, and he's like, isn't that great? And we're like, (laughs) no. The kid in the episode, he's like, I love this story. Old West, gunslinging, no girls. And I was like, yeah, there's no women in this script Mm -hmm. at all. Like, I think that's the only episode that doesn't have a single female character, even in the background. Like, that's, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I know. It's funny, because I just got notes back, and one of the writer, uh, because we, when we send out our, when we write our first draft and our out. Uh, and our outlines we send them out to the team and get notes back and one of the guys said there's only a couple guys in this show and i'm like yeah let's talk about that like let's go back and see how many shows you've done with only a couple girls or no girls but it's funny because of course you notice it when Mm. you know it's like oh there's not many guys in this show yeah it's amazing as it should be it's amazing how privilege does this thing where it's like oh i Mm -hmm. i didn't notice that I know, yeah, and like you it. don't, you don't, and I know it goes for me too, the opposite direction too. I'm like, yeah, I guess not, you know, but um, so I think it's it's been a good balance. Um, to, but yes, I have had to fight a few battles in there, but they're they're very gracious and they let me do my girl shows. So, and thankfully, they let me do other shows too. So I don't have to do just girl shows. So you've written a lot of romantic episodes. Mm -hmm. You've come up with some famous love interests, like Mrs. Sutton, everyone's favorite love interest (laughs) you've come up with. I Um, love Mrs. Sutton. Mrs. Sutton is amazing. By the way, named after my, um, I had a a roommate, actually, when I first moved out to Colorado, who earned her last name as Sutton, so Mark Sutton. That's where that came from. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so, do you ever feel like you're pigeonholed into writing romantic episodes, uh, like, especially after everything with Mitch? Um, no, I think because, um, the team, we don't, and I understand this, we don't want a lot of romance in the show just because it's not something that we want to put a lot of emphasis on as important. So we want it to be natural for the characters in their own arc and in their own journey to, yeah, you know, have a relationship, but not necessarily feel like, you know, we have to have everybody in a relationship. There always has to be some love thing going on or kids having crushes. Like, I think it's it's great to address, but nothing that we want to just do all the time. So mm-hmm. they haven't. In fact, I really had to, I just um, wrote a show that was recorded in July called Wits Women. No. Met his match. Well, I called it Wits Women. Yes, <laughs> the actual show is Wits Women, and it's um, Jules and Penny trying to set um, to set Wit up, thinking that okay, you know, like that sounds amazing. He should, he really should move on and pass Jenny, and you know, find somebody else for his his golden years here. So, because um, he really only has like two left, right? How old is Wit? No. He's, he's fine. He's going to live forever. Um, it's confirmed. Yes. Not yeah. that. We have that. <laughs> oh, sometimes that bites me when I say things. Um, but anyway, but it was one of, like, Dave Arnold was like, you can't put lid on a date, you know, like, you can't do this. Like, they really pushed back on that about, you can't do wit, wit, not wit, you know. And so they finally, they did let me do it. And so... He is what's going on a date. Well, it was kind of a thing that happened with where the wedding bells toll, where um, the current wit there, Paul Merlinger, yeah. I believe, his wife found out that Wit was dating Margaret in that episode, and it was uh-huh. about like engagement, and she was like, you better not start dating. <laughs> I about that. <laughs> Which I always thought was yes. pretty funny. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we or we mentioned Meta's match later in the question, so... We know, obviously, with Meta's match coming up, this could, you know, hit on something soon, but without giving away future plans, you know, Mm -hmm. if you could, like, without restrictions, pair Connie with any character past or present in the show, who would you put her with? Or no one, you know, if you want. Um, Like you said, there's nothing wrong with keeping characters No one, no one. Yeah. No one? Yeah. I... 
Um, although I liked the relationship with Mitch, I didn't see that going long term. Like yeah. I just, I wanted, I felt it, it kind of hindered Connie too much. And, um, and I know that's not popular, but I just, I didn't, he wasn't the right one for her. And yeah. so I, um, and I know Jeff Lewis has been introduced, um, but I'm not really Jeff sold Lewis. on him yet either. So I, I'm not going to for sure rule that one out, but I'm, I'm not rooting for it. I'll say that. Okay. And, Good to know. and people I know really like Connie and Jason and, but the whole older brother, like he's like in his early forties, she's mid twenties. Each confirmation, each confirmation. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wait, what was this? Uh, we always she speculate age about ages, and we never oh. know how old anyone is no, or what like, decade like, they are. Thank you. Like the, I feel like less people look over the age because Townsend's voice sounds so young, but you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jason, yeah. Jason's up there. He Love is, the and so He's I just mean, like I'm way older than you. Yeah, and so I, I, and I don't think people realize that there is kind of age difference there, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, age and Odyssey is such its own. Yeah. It's its own thing. So. Yeah. Um, it's hard to even say, like, could I, I mean, I could be convinced he's in his late thirties, but I couldn't, I don't know, putting the two of them together would just feel incestuous. Yeah. Is yeah. that a word I can say on here? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know, I, no, I, was, I, was, I was actually about to say the same thing because there's okay. been such a strong, like, Wit yeah. and Connie are very much like a French role. When I was young and, like, very first listening to the show before I really, like, knew who the character relations were, I'd actually assumed that Connie was Wit's adopted daughter. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. In, in, like, the yeah. first album or two we had of the show, from, like, just from context, that's what I assumed. Yeah, we listened were. to the albums in a really weird order growing up. The first well, just the we first ever... couple ones, and then we're like, you know what, let's what, what, start what was your one. What was the first episode that um, you heard? The first album we ever heard the, Well, we had tapes first. We, we had, a couple, had like, chick, a couple... We had a couple Chick-fil-A tapes. Chick-fil-A yeah. doesn't exist in Canada, but, like, mm-hmm. relatives had, like, gotten, uh, eaten down there, gotten a couple of tapes at different times, and, like, brought them back. So we had Gifts from Magic Guy. This is Chad Pearson. Suspicious Minds. Suspicious Minds and the Popsicle Kid. The first album we ever got for Devin's <laughs> birthday. An odd assortment. When he was like seven or something like that. So I would have been about like five or six or you were like eight. And it was Battle Lines and we listened to the first. So the last album. Wow. Um, there, there's a way to start. Yeah. yeah. We listened so, to the first CD and then our mom came into our room that night and we were Black like Vail. crying. We're listening to the Black Veil. <laughs> So. <laughs> she comes in, we're just freaking out, and so we're like, okay, let's put that in the cupboard for a couple of years. Then we got, because that was the newest <laughs> album at the time, our yeah. grandma had bought it for us. And Thankfully, so the next, she still let you listen, you know. Yeah. The next one we got was the next one after that, It was that, Friends, 39. Family, and Countrymen, okay. so then, like, so then it was, we opened up with Mitch and Connie, and in between you and me, and it was like, okay, this is a lot better. The downside mm-hmm. was that when we finally did go through Novacom, you know, not only had we heard bits and pieces of Battle Lines, but we'd heard 39, so we knew Mitch was alive and back together with Connie. And, so like that. So and like, we oh, also, yeah. another one of the earliest albums we heard was 44, so Eugene Returns. So we knew <laughs> Eugene's entire backstory <laughs> with Katrina by the time yeah, we actually but, you know, listened to everything yes. chronologically. That's life. And but... after a couple, then we went back to one, we were like, you know what, let's get them all in order. You know, so it's, we actually it's time know to what's happening. And start from the beginning. I mean, that's, I, my first show that I heard was For Whom the Wedding Bells Toll, which is funny because it just tells everybody's like backstory you know it's like all mm-hmm. this stories that have been going on for a while that you know and so and I still loved it but yeah it kind of gave away some things for me too you know yeah. to go back through but then but that was actually when I first started working for Odyssey was I had to go through and just listen to all the shows so I probably spent like two weeks of my life just like and there's I loved lot, it like I loved it like I had to you know there's a couple times I had to pull over on the side of the highway to cry you know when Timmy died and you know things like that same but, um it was like non-stop and then I was like Odyssey forever you know as soon as they started so yeah we both yeah. started so, in new places we have a question or I have a question rather about Jay because Jay's another yes, one yeah. of those characters who is my child and I just love him mm-hmm. so much so, if or when Whit Hertford returns to the U.S. because he's 
not there right now. Doing his and reclaims stuff. his J mantle. What plans would you have for his character? Not giving away too much because I loved Jay's little arc so much, and then he disappeared. It seemed like his that. his development was really starting to like start to ramp up, yeah. and then it's like, oh, sorry, now Wit has to go acting school in the UK and do yes. that stuff. So, um, well, Jay should go into business with Wellington. <gasps> oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Who else do you like? We'll just put everybody together there, Victoria. Yes. Yeah. I want I want Wellington and Jay and Jared to be in an episode together. They'll that start they'll favorite. start a rival ice cream shop, you know. Oh my and gosh. I, <laughs> they would have Wellington. such wicked business practices. They'd it's be for, so devious. It'll they can call it Wits End because Wit hurt for <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It'll be good. The other Wits End. Um well um Jay is back. In the country, and I heard he might Whit be is but back I wasn't in the country. Sure. Um, he, but he's out of state. However, I wrote a show for him that will be recorded in January. Uh, so I'm excited, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I think there was even one recorded. There should be another one coming out before then, even with him in it. Um, well, that, there we that go. makes me so happy. So, Every single episode that comes out now, because I heard like a rumor that yes. um, Jay might be returning soon. So every episode I listen to where I don't know what's going to happen, I'm like, is Jay going to be in this Yeah, one? Yeah, he's, I mean, I, I don't know if we can, how much we can do with him just because we have to fly him in now for, you know, so it just kind of adds that extra layer of complication, Rochelle. Mm-hmm. But we love him as a character, and... There's definitely more we want to do with him. So, um, yeah, I think I think you'll see him. I know you're going to see him a couple more times at least, and I think you'll you'll see him more than that. So, so <clears throat> speaking of uh, Victoria characters that Victoria is obsessed with, yes, um, <laughs> she she had she sent me a lot of Wellington. I questions had so many Wellington had... <laughs> questions. Some of them were jokes. Well, my favorite one, the one that made Devin laugh really really hard when I was like across the house was. Can Wellington have his own spin-off show? That one was not sent to you. <laughs> he, so, uh, he, like, went through all my Wellington I filtered, questions. I think he took, like, two or something like that. I, uh, I filtered out a few questions. So generally about Wooten and Wellington. Uh, first off, who's older of the twins? Wellington and Wooten. We'll get an official non-Tory Martin confirmation. I, you know, Nathan would be the, the one to answer that question. I feel like I've always... My gut is that Wellington is a few minutes older, but I don't know. Like See, that's, I, I feel like that's the obvious answer, but I'm like, I could also see it going I, both in ways. In my mind, it's 50-50. Like, what does yes. that mean? <laughs> no, I mean, like, I could totally see Wellington being older, but I also could understand from a storytelling point of view like why it would be really great okay. if Wooten was older I thought because you then Wooten could be like I'm the older brother and then it would like burn Wellington up inside I thought you meant 50-50 like they were no. both born at the same time no that's, like Victoria. No, that's not what I meant that's no wonder how... we never heard from their mothers <laughs> no. or that Wellington was born first but then they find out later that they got switched and so <sighs> Wooten was really born first because Wellington is Wooten, and Wooten is Wellington. That would be interesting. <laughs> That's why they look so similar. I'd love to know how Wellington would react to that. <laughs> so, so Wellington thought he was older his entire life, but then he finds out he's the right. younger and one. And just finding, just on the most, like, on the most formality, semantic level, that technically he's Wooten, like, <laughs> that would just kill him. So, on, so then, talking about Wooten's past, like, after... Wooten's been on the show for quite a few years now. Yes. We still know extremely little about his past. We get, you know, like the little jokey lines about like, oh, my great uncle so-and-so did this crazy thing. Yes. Or like, you know, these very ambiguous vague lines about his past, which are clearly meant as jokes not meant to be explained as the point of the joke. Mm-hmm. Um, so compared to other main characters, most of them, we know quite a lot about their backstory. And back in the day, that made a lot of sense for Wooten because his whole persona was like, I'm mysterious and ambiguous yeah. and you never see my face in the artwork and stuff like that. Um, we did So nowadays, his character is way more of an open book, generally speaking. So mm-hmm. are we ever going to hear any flashback episodes about his past? Like, we, um, we got a little bit of it. He went to Alaska and that was exciting. But He like, mentioned his parents and we've we never, screamed a little bit. We've never 
actually heard any scenes in the past with him young. We don't know why he moved to Odyssey specifically, because obviously he didn't grow up there. So mm-hmm. any of this stuff are we going to learn? Well, there is a show coming up that's been recorded um, that will tell you why, why Wooten came to Odyssey. Uh, yes. <laughs> We've been asking that specific question for so long. And, yeah, pretty much since welcoming Wooten. And um, you can take some pride in knowing that you were inspirational. In oh my gosh. So, um, <laughs> but, because you have brought this up, and I'm like, My Wellington sure, obsession yeah. is paid although, off. Although yes. it makes me, I mean, I need to, I know you're going to watch all the details, so now I'll have to go back and figure out everything, <laughs> all those little comments that you're talking about, like every little, mm-hmm. my great aunt so-and-so, or back when I didn't have toys, you know, or whatever, like, and get those all in line, because... I know if we do some backstory that contradicts any of that, you'll shoot daggers at me. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean Nathan. Nathan may be like the official holder of the Odyssey canon, but you know, we pay attention to a thing or two. You do, and, and you we do. write it down. You write everything <laughs> down. So, um, I, I am. We are having a writers' meeting. Um, in the end of September, which is kind of sort of when we start brainstorming the next album, which we already have the next album done. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. you know, from what has been heard, but yeah. you know, future albums after that, I don't even know the numbers anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah. But um, honestly, it's okay. I get confused. Now too. Honestly, ever since they went down to six episodes, I found it really hard to keep track of which one we're on because they're so yeah. short and they happen so fast. Right. It's like now we, I even feel like I'm starting to lose track, especially with the odd cast. It's like we're behind schedule and then we're trying to catch up on everything. And then the OEC is, or the AIOC now is running mm-hmm. in the background behind it. And it, it does start to muddle things. It is. And then I'm always like, he's like, Oh, was that an OAC show? AIO. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know um, it's, yeah. it's um, yeah, and which is which, and and for me, I'm also wondering, like, has that aired yet? Because mm-hmm. to me, it's already been a year that since we've recorded something, and then it's exactly. finally it coming it. out, and then I'm like, oh, we. So I'm always like careful about like how much am I saying, and mm-hmm. or can I say that yet? Has that even come out yet? So um, anyway, but we're meeting, um, and that is one of the things on my list of pitches is some more about. Wooten's backstory. So, because nice. in this episode that tells you why he um, he came, it also brings up some more questions. So, Ooh. anyway, okay. I'm really excited now. <laughs> I'm usually really worried about spoilers, but you're the only person I'm okay with getting spoilers <laughs> from when it comes to Honesty. <laughs> well, good. I hope it's. I hope you like it. It's always like uh, we'll if it has his backstory, I'm certain I will. Okay. So, uh, so Wellington question. We have one, one, one more question. question I allowed. Okay. Um, okay, so this one, uh, these ones are important to like the who's older. So mm-hmm. Wellington has started appearing in several recent episodes after being gone for a long time, and I freaked out about it a lot, as you know. Um, do you have any plans to put him in any more episodes or develop him in any? new ways because now it seems like he's a little bit closer to Wooten than he used to be and -hmm. also something I've always wondered is his accent fake because like Wooten doesn't have it and Winston doesn't have it and his grandpa doesn't have it and I think it's hilarious we haven't met his his mom but I think the idea of him like having a fake accent is hilarious just because he pretends to be so much better than I I think I think he's developed it because He's that pretentious, you know, that he's decided that I should sound like, you know, like that. Plus, we have to make him sound distinct from Wooten. So, um, so yeah, he's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think he was born with that. So, but, um, and as far as future ideas for Wellington, um, we don't have anything right now, but the thing with, well, I mean, even with the wedding show, we sort of knew Wellington had to be there because he'd been part of, sh- you know, shows that also had to do with the courtship and, and or the, you know, the engagement. And so, um, and so originally he was going to have kind of a, you know, just a bit part, you know, kind of come in for the gags. And, um, but it wasn't until I started outlining it that I'm like, oh, 
we could really have fun with the two of them together. And so, thank you um, for that. Thank so, you so much. And so, and so I say that because it's like, you know, it's there's a lot there that we could do if we started thinking about it. So, so no, we don't have plans right now, but he's they're just a great combination together, and they're a lot of fun. So I would. I think that I think that we should do more with Wellington. Yes. Quick question, just for yeah. me: Can I have the official mantle of number one Wellington fan? You, it is yes, yours. Yes. It is yes. Yours. <laughs> it confirmed. I really want to get a T-shirt that's just white, and I write on Sharpie um, on it, "Number one Wellington fan," and wear it around, and everyone will be like, "Who is that?" And then or I'll what? just force them to They'll listen. Probably to think it should just say, city. "Is it? Is it say? How are you? Very Wellington, thank you." <laughs> also i think my favorite wellington line now might be next to him doing the chicken dance in one uh, of nothing the, but the half truth yeah nothing but the half truth mm-hmm. is when um he introduces himself to connie because that was just the most in the wedding amazing moment where she was like oh you must be the best man he's like in every way yeah. my dear and i was like oh my gosh victoria so started swooning <laughs> One of the lines that was kind of, Do they have the like the beef line? There isn't. That's uh, not in there. Do, I remember thinking like that joke, like that should be a joke, but I don't think that was in I there. think it, it was cut, right. but the, w- one of the jokes that was in there originally was whenever Wooten introduced Wellington, he would say, this is my brother Wellington, like the beef. And Wellington would always get <laughs> annoyed with that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> um. Oh, that's great. So we uh, we talked earlier about how you know you came in to the show in the Al Jansen era, and a number mm-hmm. of new other writers came in at the same time. And then we had a lot of split episodes in the era, album thirty three, album thirty four, and then Paul started Novacom, you know, obviously to be Novacom, but also as a way to bring all of the writers together collaboratively to kind of you know bond everyone into right. a team. Yeah. So how do you feel that that collaboration worked to serve that? experience building and relationship building process i mean everyone. talk about night and day to go from split episodes to this huge story arc multiple. good transition 40, 40 yes good good change. i mean crazy yeah and uh, now i will say i mean i was a new writer at the time and like just getting my feet wet in this and so and i know that was phil's thinking is that okay like we don't want to throw them into the deep end of the pool here like let's you know, start some simpler shows. And I think he, I mean, and it's, and he also talked about like, what well, kids need, you know, get things to move quicker and faster. And, um, and so I, I feel like it was a good experiment. Um, not one that we'll likely go back to, but it served its purpose. And, um, and I slept floor, you know, came out of that album. So, um, Devin's favorite episode. <laughs> I like it, you know. You like it's a good. There's a you lot like it good... like Victoria likes Wellington, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I think it's that episode favorite, has good but... commentary, but yeah. I, it has Richard. I have some tiny hang-ups. There's maybe not so tiny. Tiny hang-ups. Yeah. Um, about Richard. And there's that a episode, lot of but... there's a lot of good jokes, a lot of good meta humor and jabs at the fandom yeah. and I slop floor. Yeah. Especially the Connie Eugene relationship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, slop... I know, which everybody wanted to see, which yeah. So. um... <laughs> I, um, and so I, I, I mean, for me as a burgeoning writer, like it's like this, okay, I got to do these quick, fun, like just kind of gag, 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 you know, kind of mm-hmm. shows. And then all of a sudden to this like mystery with all these undertones and setups and payoffs and, you know, um, callbacks and everything that, um, had to be so carefully mapped out. So for me, it was, it was really good. And as far as bonding us together as a team, for sure it did that. Like, we would spend hours in the the war room. We called it, like, our brainstorming room with this whiteboard that took up, like, a whole wall and just mapping everything out and, um, and grabbing ideas here and then using it with somebody else's idea over here. And it was just, it was a ton of fun, and I think it was a really good team bonding experience. So to, uh, <laughs> to close out, or not yet to close up the Novacom stuff, but Victoria yeah. insisted that we include this. So our favorite behind the scenes story of all time from Adventures in Odyssey 
is the emergency deathbed wedding cake they can pawn a rush <laughs> order for when for we, Eugene and um, Katrina. When we interviewed Katie and Will uh, last, we, yeah, we, last two year? Two years ago. Two years ago. Which is crazy. It's been we, two um, It's not because we haven't been able to get interviews. It's because we've been so just busy with life and with mm-hmm. other stuff that yeah. we just hadn't realized it had been that but long. But we, yeah. when we interviewed them, we brought up the cake, and they actually had never heard of that oh, until we told so them, so we got to see their reactions. Oh, funny. And yeah, it was, it have, it was yeah. really funny. Because they weren't there for it, yeah. So, should I tell the story? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, okay, so um, after this whole thing, like, I mean, we did author Novacom, and finally, I mean, oh, and of course, the very, very long and drawn out engagement and relationship with Eugene and Katrina, like when they got married, it was oh, time to celebrate. And um, and so we were having a t- team meeting that day. And so I was like, you know, we need a cake. We should have a cake because this is exciting. And so I called the local grocery store and said, um, you know, can we, I know this is last minute, can we just do a wedding cake for... Um, you know, just a sheet cake just for a wedding. And they're like, okay, what do you want to say? And I'm like, congratulations, Eugene and Katrina. And then she said, um, and what are the wedding colors? I'm like, oh, well, this is fun. <laughs> like, this is like, um, well, blue and white, because he has periwinkle blue eyes. And so that's her yep. favorite color. And that's what like, I was going to say. Aw, you know, and I'm like, yeah. And she doesn't like carnations. She's allergic. But, you know, roses, you can put around the edges. And so, I mean, because at this point, like, I know these people. These are my friends, you know? Like, I know Eugenia Katrina. And so, so I'm just kind of talking to them. And she's like, well, it's last minute. I'm like, yeah, well, she had to get married at her father's deathbed. <laughs> you know? like, and so, like, and then, and, which is true. But, it just, but then, like, so her reaction was like, oh, you know, like, she felt so bad. And I'm like, oh, boy, what do I do now? So I just went along <laughs> with it. And, um... And they put a rush on the cake, and we had cake. And I remember telling the team about this when I brought it in, and I'm like, they think that, you know, there was actually a deathbed wedding. They're like, Kathy. But then, oh, cake. Yeah, so, <laughs> cake, well, whatever. We at least got cake out of it. So, anyway. and that, the moral of the story. <laughs> yes, exactly. But um, that shows how how personal we take our characters. They're, they become part of us. But and then it was... It must have been... Um, really interesting because Eugene and Katrina were already like kind of in an off again on again relationship when you came into the show as a writer and yeah. then after you started writing uh, and you said for whom the wing bells toll had already happened so they were already like engaged so yes. then you got to be on the other side when they were married right so basically and cool. kind of figuring out how are we going to do this because then um, like Will, Eugene was gone for mm-hmm. a while in there and we weren't even sure what was going to happen and yet we like we can't take our audience on this total roller coaster with them to break it off, you know? So it was really um you know, figuring all that out was fun. But they got married. They did. Yay. And then and now they have Puck. <laughs> and a puppy. Uh, and then we had oh, another we... cake come in for um Wooten and Penny's wedding, and that was Katie I B's cried when I idea. Was she was like, we need a cake. Probably because she talked to you guys and was like, they got a cake for the last wedding. Why don't we get a cake? <laughs> so anyway, so we had to bring in a cake on that day, too. You ordered that one a little more in advance, I hope. No, it was, I think. Or just didn't tell them it was for a wedding. No, but yeah, exactly. I think Sam just went to the grocery store and just had them, like, you know, write it real quick up. And okay. so it was... But. I was like walking home when I listened to them actually get married in that part, and I was like crying while I was walking home. Um, and we haven't review, we haven't released our crash course review yet, but no. we recorded it yesterday. It'll come out before this episode. Um, Devin and I were like walking around UBC campus, and I was listening to Crash Course for the first time the other day. Uh-huh. And then I was shaking him when they were mentioning the puppy. I was like, "Fuck, gets a puppy! My puppy gets a puppy! Oh my gosh!" <laughs> Uh, I had to that my daughter really wanted there to be a dog in Odyssey. So I think it'll be really good for Buck. So uh-huh. you get and, the you, and Eugene and Katrina, and you, yeah, of course. So I'm excited everyone. to see how. Yes. So that was a fun show to write too. So as we close off Novacom stuff, I feel there needs to be at least an only one obligatory question about Mitch. Mm-hmm. So because you know you can't escape it. Fine. So. 
Honestly, that's my favorite thing in Something Old, Something New, Chris's wrap-up for that episode. Where she's like... <laughs> she's like, hey guys, we're done with this. <laughs> she's like, well, I guess that finally lays to rest the question of Mitch. You guys can all stop writing in and asking us about Mitch. Everyone can let it go now. It's the, <laughs> definitely the, the subtext of her wrap-up on that episode. Aww. So, after, after I, I, I know, I, I disappointed a lot of people, and I feel bad. <laughs> we were I, I mean, We were in the boat where we were like, bring Mitch back. I, he needs to be with Connie. We're I, like, we're okay with this. I 100% agree with you. I really like, like I connected in my mind to um, when Connie was writing her book and then after she's like, you know, I lost the book. What does this all mean? And I, I felt like God was calling me to write this book and now it's all gone. What was the point? And mm-hmm. it's like, well, maybe God was calling you to write the book. That doesn't mean he was calling you to publish the book the process of writing the book for you was something that helped spiritually grow you and the purpose that was the purpose for you it wasn't actually to have the book published Mm -hmm. and in that same way you know Mitch and Connie's relationship was definitely a big growing experience for both of them and it was a good thing that it happened for what it was but it wasn't meant to go beyond that yeah they got out of it a lot of it and it was meant to be what it was and they both grew from it but it wasn't meant to go farther than that because you know in the long term they weren't good for each other yeah I like that's very well put yes because I think I think that happens all the time people come into our lives that shape us and change us and but they're just there for a season you know and then Mm -hmm. you move on and there's other people that help you grow and change so um I value that season with Mitch but Mm -hmm. it is over (laughs) So. so so our question is when you know after it ended and people kept on asking about it did it bother you that people couldn't let it go or as a writer did you kind of feel happy like that you created a character that had such a lasting impact that you know it stuck with people um I mean you always feel bad like if you've disappointed you know your the fans and um but for me it was I mean it's pretty early on in my career and so feeling like wow people really connected with this character is um it is gratifying in that sense. So, um, um, kind of a mixture of feelings, I think, with that. And so, because I did, I did want people to be happy with it. And, but I also kind of knew long term, like even though in the short term it might have been fun to have, you know, her getting married because that would be a fun show. But then. Mm-hmm we'd have to do all the years after that too, you know? So it's like, it's a huge change in the character. And is that long-term, is that worth it? Is that what we want to do with the character? And does that make her less relatable to Mm -hmm. the audience? And, um, because I do feel like we've lost some of that with Eugene. Um, I still love Eugene, but, um, but his character had to change, you know, to some, on some level. So, um, I really, I'm not anxious for, for Connie to get married at this point. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I mean, I know everyone loves to ship every character that they can, but mm-hmm. honestly, like, when I see a movie or a TV show that's like, you know what, not every character has to be in a romance, mm-hmm. you know? That's not the be-all and end-all right. of existence. I'm right. so grateful that people can recognize, like, you know what, there are other things in life than relationships that doesn't, you know... And the question that we wrote for you about, like, if you wanted Connie to be in a relationship, uh, that was one of my questions, but Devin, but it was a little bit different. And then Devin wrote down like, okay, who do you want Connie to be with? I was like, no, add or single. Mm-hmm. Or single's mm-hmm. an option too. Yeah. Add it. Yeah. I mean, I, it could happen down the line. But right now, I, just, I mean, I do feel like she's happy. She's well adjusted. She's, you know, she's doing great. So I don't think she, she needs that right now. Mm-hmm. And I do want to show that. I do want to show that, okay, you don't need a man in your life or a woman in your life, you know, to, to complete you. And like, she's, Mm -hmm. so I I want her to be a role model in that sense too. Yeah. It's good. It's very good. So you can ask the one. Okay. How do you approach the writing differently for an Odyssey club episode versus a broadcast episode? If you do at all. And you mentioned earlier, like, sometimes it's like, oh, I don't even, like, remember which is which. So maybe there is no difference. But. There is in the sense of um, if it's a canon show, like, if it's one that really affects our characters to the point, like, I mean, mm-hmm. all the, the Penny and Wooten, you know, wedding was going to be an album show, obviously, you know. And yeah. um, 
And so there's certain things that, that we just know, okay, this changes our character. And so we need to make sure that this is, or this tells us something really significant about our character that we need to make sure is available for everybody to, to mm -hmm. hear. So, um, so it kind of makes it, I actually just did a, um, a buck show, um, that is going to go, is going to go in the OAC. And there was, there was sort of a, a push and pull on that one because some people thought, well, this does develop Buck's character, so um, it's you know where should it go? Should it go in the can in the album or or in the OAC? And ultimately, I don't feel like it changes his character enough, you know, that mm -hmm. it couldn't be in the OAC. I keep saying OAC. You know what I mean? The AIO. AIO. Yeah. Yeah. We, keep, we keep saying, we keep saying, it, saying too. it too. Rebranding, so, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I am. Um, so that's one factor is, is you're going to get probably more one-offs or, you know, and things like that, as opposed to the, the story arc stories, um, are going to be more in the album shows, um, if that makes sense. Yep. But I do yeah, like, it's always, Oh, it's, it's, it's interesting with something happening, you know, cause when it means when something happens in an AIOC episode, every time we're like, so is this real? Like, it, mm -hmm. like when Renee showed up, and so far she's only been in there, but she, her name just got mentioned in Crash Course. Mm -hmm. So we're like, is she ever going to appear? Because it's like, is she allowed to be in in the albums yeah. because she's only she was introduced in the AOC. We have a joke about her being shoved in a closet whenever it's an album <laughs> episode, and then they like pull her out when it's an OAC, here. but they accidentally forgot to close the closet, and that's why she was walking around in Crash Course. Right. Well, yeah. they saw her on the street. She was running away from what's like, <laughs> Her first day of work was like tra was existentially traumatic uh, enough, and then it just yeah. went downhill from there. I think there's a thought that these are there are some OAC characters, um, AIOC characters, because if we brought them into the albums, then we'd have to reintroduce and explain who they are. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that's cut in, set in stone. I mean, I think there's... Some of them, I mean, Buddy and Zoe are and both Captain crossed Ab over. Mm -hmm. no, no, not Captain, absolutely. Um, Drake was oh, yeah, originally Drake in the OAC before he appeared in the yeah, albums. Right. So some people have managed to bridge that dimensional gap and make it in there. But. The other thing is we, we used to do a lot more partner shows with other ministries and so we did a lot of like of shows that were, you know, Alaska or New Zealand or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And um and going forward we're doing less partner shows and so that kind of keeps it more central to Odyssey. So there might be um you know so that would be less of a distinction I guess between the two then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's been nice, like, getting to see all of the different locations and cultures, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's also nice to be, like, okay, getting, you know, we're seeing the actual show. There's, uh, there's pros and cons of both, and I imagine the costs mm -hmm. of, you know, especially doing travel things and for the documentaries, too, when yeah. you guys actually send someone abroad mm -hmm. to film stuff. There, You know, some cool stuff is coming out of it. I don't know if you saw on our first anniversary episode we had clips or um we had some kids from the african children's choir were staying with us oh, wow. and they they were from ethiopia so i made chapati for them oh. from the the recipe from the the web documentary that is for awesome. the very first episode and, and then devin got them to eat it he was like eat this and they're like yep that's they were good. really excited they saw it and they knew exactly oh, really? what it was and stuff it was, it was and i was like moment. no don't eat devin's cooking so so we like, what show was that from we, was that the it was our so the show was um, the launch. It was the very okay. first AIOC episode, or the pilot. And no, because the, no, the pilot the, was the last one before. Yeah. The pilot was in album okay. thirty-seven. Okay. Or top thirty-seven. So which one? 30, it was fifty-seven. What was the launch about? The um, launch that was, was Jeff's... Wit and no. Wit and Wooten go to Ethiopia okay. and in the Karamojong region helped Yeah, and there's like a war. car scene where they're being shot at, okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And the pilot was the Jeff and Connie and, you know, Jeff was in South America. Yeah. yeah. With uh, Lily and And there's like that lady that was like bleeding out her eyes <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because they, they were a consecutive episodes, so it was kind of easy to mm -hmm. swap them because they were both foreign missionary yeah. episodes, two-parters that were be directly back-to-back -back with each yeah. other. And they kind of led into each other. Anyway. Yeah, anyways. 
Um, so to move on to stuff that you've written this year, um, one more name, Emily Le- Emily White was wondering in the official podcast interview that you did about it, you mentioned that your daughter Bella had two small parts mm-hmm. in parts one and three. So on AIO Wiki, it says that she was young Lily in part three, but who did she play in part one? It was during the montage scene where showing just all these things that Irena is, you know, children that Irena is rescuing. So she had one line and it was, yes, mom. And I don't think it was even credited because it was like, you know, young girl, you know, or child number four or whatever it was. Um, And so, um, yeah, I I think that's why she just didn't, just because it was such a a bit thing. So uh, how do you make, just like generally as as writers slash directors, how do you make decisions about when you put in a family member in a role? Like, do you plan it in advance and bring this them? Is the or first, is it kind of a spur of the moment? This is the first time I've used my kids in a show. Um, and I didn't even cross my mind until we started getting toward the end. And there's and what we do is we record all the main characters in, um, in Burbank. And then yeah. there's oftentimes so little bit pieces, like little line, you know, line here and there you know, mm-hmm. a waitress that comes in that has a line or whatever, and um, that we can record back at Focus um, just with employees or whoever. And um, so, of course, with our kids, you know, there's not many four-year-old employees at Focus. So um, it's... I hope not. <laughs> um, Surprise, we're, we're actually undercover yeah. uh, child producers. Exactly. <laughs> We've been playing the long con. <laughs> um, so... When, um, so it kind of as we realized that we needed some kids, of course, then I started thinking, hmm, well, I know my, I know Bella would love to do it, but there's also that part of like, okay, I don't want to get so attached to it that if she doesn't do a good job, then that, you know, I have to let her be replaced because, mm-hmm. so you sort of don't want to be pushy about it either because you want to, and so yeah. that's why I had, I mean, like Nathan came in to direct and, you know, it was sort of this like, okay, if it works, then great, but if it doesn't, no hurt feelings, you know, and if you have to mm-hmm. replace it, and end up being fine. And then she also had a little part in um, Swept Away. She was the the little girl on those um, bookend scenes oh. in Swept Away. Okay, we're so. wondering about that. So Kelsey was the mom then there? Yes. Like Kelsey Lansdowne? Yes, yeah. Yes. I was right, see, I told I think, you. Don't, don't quote me on that one. Okay. You're I, just, wrong. I just know. Yeah. I, just, sure I know right. we used Kelsey, but I wasn't. I wasn't out there for that recording, so okay. I can't say for sure. Bombs remember, right. remember that part we talked about how I shouldn't be a coordinator because I'm not all that organized, getting <laughs> facts straight, and stuff like that. This is one of those times where I'm like, all right, don't you know, don't quote me on it. So another writing question. Uh, you said in your interview for one more name with the official podcast interview that you almost never listen to your own episodes Mm -hmm. since it's or at least until like at least a a year afterwards Mm -hmm. yeah since it's like out of your hands at that point and you might want to make changes um so as and we get that yeah i definitely get that editing the episodes you know when i'm going back what we said about this episode i'm like oh i should have added that that so if you could go back and rewrite any past episode that you've written what what episode would you want it to be and what thing would you want to change um i would probably i wasn't happy with happy hunting i probably would have redone that one um there was definitely parts in parker for president that i wasn't thrilled with and um and i was how to sink a sub i think i liked the show but because it ended up cut it was too long and so they ended up cutting the first scene and so i don't know there was some parts missed so i do feel like i i should have edited it more at the writing stage so they you know, cut it down some of the scenes so they didn't have to chop a whole scene. Like, it's things like that that I'm like, mm. mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of, and in every, in every, every show, there's a part where I'm like, oh, I wish we could have hit that joke better, or I wish we could have gotten a different take on that line, or, you know what I mean? There's always, um, there's always going to be a line or two that you wish could change. But, 
Um, so, but then there's the times when you're like, mm, that just didn't come out how I wanted it to. <laughs> so, um, but overall, and the funny thing is that um, I've, I have, now that my kids listen in the car and things like that, like I almost have to listen to the shows more. So, which is, is good. There's still some shows that I'm like, yeah, I'm not listening to that show. Sorry if I wrote, you know, that I wrote that I'm like, mm, no. But, um, but like my kids were on the wedding kick, the very best at wedding. And they listened to that one a lot. And I was like, okay, I like that one. We can do that one, you know. So <laughs> there's some that I'm okay with, I guess, now more than others. So on a, on a similar but opposite note then, going forward, if you could write any episode where whatever you want happens, use any characters, do whatever you want, and you don't need approval from Dave or the rest of the team, you just have, you know, carte blanche to do whatever you want, what what would you want to write? Um, I and, would, and I would have... Table, like people, people who are off the show, people who passed away, oh like you goodness. could bring back anyone that wow. you want. Wow. Um, You're all powerful. Yeah. Yes. Well, Jesus comes back. And like, um, <laughs> um, We're doing revelations. <laughs> exactly. Um, I... I do think it would be fun if Whit got married, but that's never going to happen. So that might be my, the one thing. Um, and besides that... That's a solid answer. <laughs> what? I said that's a solid answer. Yeah. That's a pretty, like, mm -hmm. I'm taking charge here. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's never going to happen. Um, so, there, and there's some things like, um, like history shows that I think that would be really fun to do, but because I know they try to not have too many history shows in a row. We're like, they're not going to let me do another World War One story for a, a long time, you know? And mm -hmm. um, so, but I'll keep them in my little file for things to pitch in a few years when they, you know, let me do another election or, you know. There are a lot another of Another war story and yes. Um, so, but for the most part, there is, like, I think there's some ideas that I've, I've had to fight for. Do or die. It was one that I had to fight for. Oh, such, um, such a good episode. Thanks. I like that one was one that I pitched so many times, and I think finally they they were just like, okay, just do it, you know. Um, and Irena, I had to pitch um, several times. Um, oh, yeah. So there's a few like that, but for the most part, they're um, and Dave's especially good about that. Saying like, okay, I'll give you a chance. Go ahead, just see what happens. And um, so I do. There's not a lot. There's, yeah, there's not a lot that I'm thinking. Wow, I wish they would let me do that. So, for the most part, they've they let me play around enough. So. All right. So um, to move on to more episodes that you wrote this year, find a penny. Uh -huh. the premiere for this last season mm -hmm. it built off of a huge amount of foreshadowing the foreshadowing is so good that have been oh sprinkled my gosh to oh, recent seasons. Was, and what? you said you already listened to that yes movie, right i know well and i when i heard the um the wedding show and you even mentioned i don't remember which one of the two you said i was like oh we get the oh we get the um this. we've seen the postcards and oh, it'd yeah. be fun to see their actual wedding and i was like oh ah! So like you guys just wait you know so i was like i can't comment on it i can't tell them but um but i was yes anyway so go ahead with your question yeah so album 62 like i said uh we had like three different episodes have three different characters receiving three different postcards mm -hmm. from stuff and then all of those exact postcards and their contents turned out to be plot critical scenes interacting with the victimizers and then a whole another season earlier than that with the wedding we had penny was packing scuba gear and connor's like why are you doing that and penny's like you never know when you might need it mm -hmm. and then it let her hide in the hotel pool when she was being chased so uh were all of these elements planned in advance like oh i'm gonna do this and then like plan far enough advance like oh we're going to do these postcard things i'll plan them in these scenes mm -hmm. here or you know did it come together after the fact and was it you who put all these things together or was it just like a team effort as writers to plan out like in terms of overall planning for the structure of their relationship to see these things in um yeah that was um i think as soon as we started talking about the wedding i was already thinking about the honeymoon 
And so I was like already thinking like how, what kind of hunting, like I knew I would never get another chance to do this again, you know, to have like, to do a honeymoon with Wooten and Penny, like they get one of those. So it's hopefully like yeah. just, I don't know. I really just wanted it to be, I, I, I don't know. I just started turning around ideas. And so um, I was thinking through the honeymoon show when I wrote the, um, the wedding show. And so that scene where she's packing is actually one that I had, I mean, I added that scene specifically for, to mention the Scooby gear. Um, and to mention that she didn't know where she was going, because that was the other important thing, is that nobody else knew where she was going, you know, that this was all a surprise. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, and so, but then the postcard idea came, pre like, shortly before a recording session of the previous album, and so I was basically emailing people out, you know, like, like this is shows that are already in polished stage and saying, can you just mm -hmm. add this, you know, add this bit thing okay. where they get a postcard and this is what it kind of has to say. And, um, like just the, the gist of it at least. And, um, and they were all gracious enough. I know, I think, um, legacy part one had one that mm -hmm. Phil yeah. stuck in there for me. And, um, fathers and sons had like one Jason where sons. Jason yes, read the then, card. I re-listened to that one. He's like, Oh, Penny got something from a nice hat lady. And I was like, you know, <laughs> yes. And, the um, kind of, I think the counselor, kind of the counselor, was that the other one? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So, and that one was my show. So that one was an easy one, but, um, yeah. So it was just this, yeah. Can you just stick this in there without making it seem obvious? Cause I also didn't want to point to it and be like, Oh, look, a postcard let's read this because this might you know so always you know to make it just as natural as possible like okay this is just part of the show so yeah um but yeah that was a, I had so much fun writing that show that was like putting a puzzle together you know of like okay what do they know here and moving backwards and well they wouldn't know this yet and how are they going to find this out and so it was yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a roller coaster a really of emotions and expectations. It was definitely. such a good season opener. Yeah, like we said, because, you know, it opens up and it's like, oh, no, Wooten lost his memory. This is something, you know, because immediately our mind goes back to Eugene Returns. And it's like, yes. this is some crazy, like, dramatic thing. And then it's like, oh, Penny's all right. So, like, oh, I guess it's just something that you just bumped in his head or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all normal. And then it turns out, oh, wait, no, he was drugged with an experimental <laughs> drug and it's international crime ring uh -huh. and all this stuff. Which was... um. Nathan's I did Nathan's um wife is a nurse and so he was mm -hmm. actually because I was trying to think of um ways he would lose his memory and I know it's kind of an overdone plot you know device so but I thought and we made the joke about Bernard yes yes yeah, yeah exactly okay. so um so there was a lot of there was team effort in you know kind of fixing up all those details and figuring out all those plot points I mean and even in my first outline Wooten went with um, um, Jason and I mean all four of them actually ended up chasing after Penny and then Dave and Phil were like you can't he's in the hospital they would never let him leave and so then I'm like and then so then I did a draft without him and then I was like I can't do this without him there and so we compromised and um, yeah, I love how, how Dr. Graham is the voice of reason when it comes to, like, because she did in Green Ring Conspiracy, and then she did it again here when, you know, someone gets, like, a movie injury and they try and get up. She's like, no, like, this is serious. You can't, <laughs> yeah. if you get hit, mm -hmm. if you lose your memory, you get hit in the head hard enough to get knocked out. Like, you can't just go walk right. it off. You right. might have heard our jokes before about how we always joke about soaplessly devoted mm -hmm. and pulling out your own ID and running away. Because that's wit. And Dr. Graham is always like, Stop. Yes. Just stay yeah. here. It is a menace to the medical community. So is Jason, and so is Monty. It runs in their family. <laughs> um, hmm. So I really appreciated that. Well, yeah. that was the team making me be reasonable. So, you know. So And I think it worked out well, the way it ended up. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with it. It was fun. So, but now um, it's sort of like, you get all, it was so much fun to do all the Wooten and Penny stuff, and now it's, you know. Normal slice so of quickly, thing. Wooten and Penny have become my favorite couple on the oh, show. Yay. They are so adorable. They are fun. I know they're, and the actors are just 
wonderful. Like, they're just wonderful people. And then I fell in love with Penny's parents, too, you know, when they came in. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, my goodness, you have to move to Odyssey. You're so fun. So We um, watched the first episode of Twin Peaks recently, oh, yeah. and we're like, it's little Kimmy. Oh. It's, it's funny with, with Penny's parents, because even in Find a Penny when they weren't there, you know, and it's transcribing down the thing over the phone, and then it just starts going off, and they start talking about, like, oh, go to this website. You get coupon deals for parking at the mm. airport in Buffalo. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Hmm. Great characters. So, um, to come to the last one that you wrote for this year, Crash Course, Mm -hmm. the finale that we just had. So, the first half of the episode is very referential to License to Drive. You know, we have Connie and Eugene are both respectively teaching their wards how to drive. And so, we get a lot of references in the process. You know, Connie's like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Say it. You know, all these, Uh these, like classic lines so away from you mm-hmm. away i wish i could have us. seen katie's reaction because that's her favorite episode of odyssey <laughs> she must have been really excited i hope yeah. to start that that's script. funny because i mean both of us drive standard and so when we both learned how to drive that was very like thinking you know thinking back to license to driving on these descriptions mm-hmm. of like you know clutches and stuff like that so you know obviously license to drive is one of if not the most popular episode of of all time so you know writing an episode that you know in its totality I wouldn't say it's like oh it's like the retake on License to Drive but the first half of it definitely is so how did you go about handling that given you know it's like so you're handling something precious such a you know such a favorite episode um yeah it's not I would it's not a remake of it so that kind of helped that it's not um it did kind of it was the impetus for that story but then it kind of took off and it did its own thing yeah um, but this, cause the idea came, I was actually laying in bed with my daughter and she listens to Odyssey at night and that was the one she was listening to. And usually I'm there for like, you know, five minutes of it. And this time I listened the whole way through and I was just thinking like, wow, like they're at a stage where they could actually be teaching their own mm-hmm. kids, you know, to, to drive. And I loved, um, I absolutely lost it at the line where. Connie's like, slow down, Jules. No one's having a baby. And I was like, I was like, Connie's just having flashbacks right now. Traumatic flashbacks. Yeah, and so a lot of that, and because it's a popular show, I thought it would be fun to do it for the fans. Like, I mean, it's one that would have hopefully make sense, regardless mm-hmm. of if you've heard, you know, License to Drive yeah. or not. But definitely wanted it to be a nod to the fans to see, like, you know, to show just those little clues and little nods to that. To that I show. listened to Odyssey at work. And um, I was listening to that episode, and I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And I was, like, doing things, but I was also jumping up and down. I was just like, this is actually happening. Yeah, when I started listening to it, I was like, this is happening. I can't believe it. <laughs> so, so, so excited. It's like that part from The Office where it's like, everyone, calm down. It's happening. Um, oh, I so, love The yeah. Office. <laughs> Two more questions, because uh, we're almost out of day. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Almost out of time. You have a plane to catch soon. Yes, yes. Um, so, last two questions, both from Tintin. Uh, what are some questions about the show that you always get asked in interviews that you're tired of being asked? And on the opposite side, what are questions that you never get asked that you wish you were? Yeah, what do you just want to tell us that no one ever asked oh. you about? Tell us your secrets. <laughs> My secrets. Um, well, as far as things that I always get asked... Um, People often ask about the whole, and this isn't one that I get tired of answering, but the whole process of writing. Like, it's funny to me how many people think that I write for Connie, and that's, like, the only character, and then everybody else writes for other characters, and we somehow, like, I don't, I don't know how that would even work, but... I think, well, I think you're it, a I, woman, yes, Exactly. So. <laughs> it, comes, it comes all back to the, like, well, you know, maybe if we had more main female characters on the show, then... Right, know. yeah, and so I... Like, I you mean, know, not to... Obviously yeah. not that it's like, oh, well, you can only write for the women, and the men can write for the I men. Know. But, I know, and that's know. not what they're saying. I know. The men can but, only write for the men. They would have been in trouble when the show first <laughs> So, but it's sort of like, I don't know how that would work if, like, you know, Nathan did all the Eugene lines and had all the Kanye lines. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not, that's always process. an interesting conversation. Like, no, that's not how it works. And so, you know, explaining, like, people are interested in how, okay, we do the brainstorming together, and then we and we each pitch ideas and then the team kind of comes back with, you know, okay, the pitches that they like and then we go to outline and first draft and second draft and um, and just that's such a long process. Like it was funny to me when people thought I was doing 
like Parker for president um, to mirror the current election. And I'm like, we didn't even know who was running when I wrote this show. Like, I mean, this is recorded like before, you know, the, any, you know, the nominations were even out, you know? So, um, yeah, can't you, Victor, can't you tell Maury is supposed to be Russia? Clearly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, or like, um, yeah, the whole Irena thing and refugees. And it's like, no, I didn't write this last week. You know, this was like, you know, two years ago that this started. So, um, it's, um, um, so I, those a lot, and a lot of people ask about Mitch and Connie and why we ended no. that. And so that's probably one that I'm like, oh, but, um, but I don't really, I love talking about Odyssey. And so people can ask me. But I am the first one to ask you really so many Wellington by. questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That I can put down Wellington. <laughs> like, no more Wellington no. questions. No, please. it's, it's fun. Like it's seriously, I mean, even watching, you know, your podcast is like, oh, that gives me so many ideas. Like, I'll come back, like, oh, yeah, we could do a show like that, or like that, you know. So it's it's so fun to to hear people's perspectives and their questions and their ideas. It's great. Yeah. And you can put our check in the mail. That's that's. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Can I just give you a credit at the end? Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, questions that you never get asked. That I wish. Um, you know, I love that you started with what you did about how I started at Odyssey because to me that's sort of one of those like, um, that was such a God story in my life and and about how He orchestrates things beyond what I could ask or imagine, you know, and um, and so I, I love, I love talking about that, um, and so I think that might be one that I'm like that I love to answer, so can't think of anything else <laughs> no no like burning things that you're always like oh i wish i could tell people about what? this but no one asks yeah. it's like no one asks about it so it's like it feels weird to bring it up without being prompted i know yeah yeah but, but that's the thing is that i don't think uh, i think i'll just tell people like, <laughs> it's good know. it's a good way to live life you know? same <laughs> which is funny like i always want people to know like the the stories from my childhood like when we rearranged our rooms and stuff and there's a lot of those parker stories that you know, were inspired by my own childhood. And so, and so I always like to, sometimes it feels, you know, it makes me self-important to be like, no, this really happened. But so, <laughs> so I guess that, in those do you cases. ever find yourself like, do you, if Parker's stories are like reflecting your own stories, are you a specific Parker sibling or does it mix it up depending on the episode in these situations? Yeah. I mean, I'm the youngest of three above of a girl, boy, girl, sibling group so yeah I would be Camilla except I'm not athletic so I'm a, I'm, I'm a less talented Camilla is wow. what well to. fortunately you have some things that make up for it <laughs> maybe but yeah my brother was very much like Matthew as far as like I mean he built a hot tub in his closet he had like little that's, con- awesome. that's, really that's concerning I know. That's- I know. <laughs> I'm the one that ran into the house that ran the car into the house so well, we're gonna know the what's gonna happen break. with Camilla's driving future. <laughs> no, no, but that but that was Jules. So that Jules. So that'd be oh, kind of, great. You know, I got, yeah. No, yeah. A little bit that of too. my little bits of my past that come in, and my kids, you know, come in there too. The stuff, so it's all it's all inspiration from everywhere. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much because yes. we're running out of time, and we want mm-hmm. you to catch your plane. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. For everything. Yes, it has been great. It's uh, it's definitely very cool, not only you know to interview you, but to be interviewing someone talk about the show, where you also know a bunch of the stuff that we've said about things already. Mm-hmm. It makes her like, you know, it makes her very interesting back and forth. When thank you for humoring my Wellington <laughs> question. <laughs> no, I love. I appreciate you both immensely. I love what you do, and I love that you're great fans and. And that you really think things through and keep us on our toes. So you inspire me and I'm Aww. grateful for you. Thank you. And your writing inspires us. So it's it it well, really all cool. in all been a fun time. Huh? Good. Yeah. Good <laughs> <feedback>. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kathy.
And, uh, yeah, I guess we should go let you catch your plane now. All right, thanks. And Thank so you. we'll turn this video back over to future Devin and Victoria to uh, wrap up this episode now. I love future Devin and Victoria. I know, they're... <laughs> I love present that happened in Victoria too. Oh, thank you. We love you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, close this up. Let's go. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh, Devin, all those facts. We are now so many facts. We are now future Devin and Victoria, beloved by Kathy, even more so than present Devin and Victoria. Oh. Uh, <laughs> So there were two. <laughs> you had this moment where you really thought about that. I would no. I was that. trying to remember what I was going to say. There are two other things that Kathy brought up with regards to what we talked about that were outside of like the main borders of what oh, we filmed. That that wasn't in the interview. No, that's why I wanted to bring it up. Oh, the okay. Now. As a special bonus for those of you who are still watching here at the end after ninety minutes. Uh, two other things. I think one which happened just outside of where we were actually doing the proper filming of the thing, and one. Uh, Kathy sent to me on Facebook afterwards because she remembered later. Um, but the day we filmed the interview was the day after we released our review of uh, Find a Penny on YouTube. Part two. Well, it was both parts. Oh, right. Um, yeah. And so, so I was still right. Kathy had a couple other notes about it. We didn't even ask questions about this. She just brought this up because we talked about it in the interview. One, or talked about it in our review, sorry. And she watches our video. <laughs> One was about the victimizers whose name we made a lot of fun of in the episode you, about how it was such so more than me. I didn't really do it such very a bad much. name. You found out, it, found mostly. out from Kathy. The reason it's such a bad name is that it was actually a uh, victimizers was a placeholder name during writing. And it was intended to be replaced with a good name once they came up with a good name. And so Kathy left it with victimizers and assumed that Nathan, who was directing the episode would put something good in there. And then he I did not. I think she said either he left it or it just kind of became like this like in joke between them like oh like oh the victimizers and so they decided to keep it in anyways in the end and the other thing is that what they call their tag team yeah. now the other thing was confirming that the pool boys not having any water when they were singing was an accident there was no reason for that it was just forgotten oh. to give them water and that that's how the pool boys work so that was the reason for that and, and I'm the number one Wellington Bassett fan. That's true. That's something That's canon. that was in the interview, but it needs to be brought up at every possible moment. And she does. And I do. So that's... I'm going to get that t-shirt, Devin. I know you will. I'm going to get that t-shirt. I know you says will. says number one Wellington fan and Sharpie on it. So that was our interview. I hope you all enjoyed it. For people who maybe this is the first video that you're watching, welcome and thank you for sticking all the way to the end. Uh, what are we doing next time, Victoria? We are going to be reviewing an OAC episode, mm -hmm. which is Angels in Corsair. Correct. I'm glad you remembered. I'm yeah, impressed. Yeah, thank you. I almost Even though we already the filmed it. So. Um, and then also opening day. Correct. I did it. Yes, that's what we're doing next time. The OAC episodes for, se or the AIOC episode for September and an appropriate pairing like a fine wine i hope you enjoy this or episode okay because it's a lot better than the next episode we didn't have a lot to say on either episode <laughs> no, no. more no. more so on one than the other you will you, you know you win some you lose some that's another timothy center episode yeah um, puns puns that's, uh, no. anyways it was a pun thank you for joining us on our side of the youtube i've been Devin francis also known as leonard Meltzner. And I am the number one Wellington Bassett fan. I'm you only get to use that outro once. No, so. I get to use it every time. And you have been watching The Adventures in Odyssey podcast. Yeah. We haven't done that in like a hundred episodes. I know. I did it so I, I could see your reaction. You wow. I was so surprised. I was really surprised. You really, you waited for a special occasion to pop that champagne cork I'm pretty out. sure I did that a couple weeks ago, but sure. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I'll let you believe that. Goodbye.